Hello, and welcome to Cornerstones Concord 101 webinar. My name is Neil Hubacher, and I'm the Director of Strategic Alliances with Cornerstone. Cornerstone is one of 40 family policy councils in as many states. And here at Corner Cornerstone, our vision is for a God-honoring New Hampshire where religious freedom flourishes, families thrive, and life is cherished. And my role as the Director of Strategic Alliances is to inspire the church to engage with government for the advancement of God's kingdom, which is precisely what brings us to this Concord 101 webinar. Our desire at this Concord 101 webinar is to uh, inspire you both with the heart as far as the big why, you know, why should we as followers of Christ engage with our civil government? And then some big what's as far as how do we do it? You know, what are the practicals of engaging? And with me, I have a veteran fighter warrior in this realm, and that is Ellen Cole. Ellen Cole, why don't you tell us who you are? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ellen Kolb, and I work with Cornerstone on communications and legislation. Advocacy is what I do. I keep an eye on the state house. I keep an eye on bills, what's coming up, what the best messages are that we can convey to our legislators. And we'll talk a little more about that later in the module. Ellen, so glad that you are doing this with me and um, just appreciate all your work over the years. It's a good team. Absolutely. So where Ellen and I head, will head today is, we are going to go through three different modules. The first module has to do with why we should engage with government as believers. What does the scripture say? What does church history say about our involvement with civil government? What is God's view of civil government? That's module one. Then Ellen will take us through module two, and module two involves the unique opportunities we have in New Hampshire to influence our state government. New Hampshire really is special among the 50 states of the union in terms of our capacity to influence our state government. And then the third module will trace how a bill becomes a law and how we can best influence that whole process. So without further ado, let me begin with module one. In module one, we're talking about why we should engage with the civil government. And what I found is, I found that we live in a central question, and that is, how are we to be engaged with the political sphere without being sucked into the political spirit? And I find that that is what most people of faith are wrestling with when it comes to the civil government. The big question mark they have is this, how are we to engage with what seems like a dirty, messy world, the political spirit, but still being involved in this governmental political sphere. And we define the political spirit by much about much of what we see today with the blame game that goes on between leaders of different parties and just the gotcha spirit that instead of working towards solutions is working towards how can I tear down someone who thinks differently than I do or believes differently than I do in, in this realm. The good news is that we see in Jesus a great handling of this dynamic, an ability to handle this question really well. In Luke's gospel in chapter 20, near the end of Jesus's life, actually during the Passion Week, we see someone address Christ bringing a question to Jesus, and he asks, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? And the person who's asking this isn't really asking for information from Jesus. They're actually coming to Jesus with this very political spirit. They're trying to trap Jesus. Essentially, they want to know, Jesus, are you pro-Israel or are you pro-Rome, our occupiers? Much like today, people want to know right away, are you conservative or are you liberal? Are you Democrat or are you Republican or some various strain thereof? And in Christ's answer, we see a great capacity to handle this, to be in the political sphere without being the political spirit. Of course, as we know, he asked the person to show him a coin. He asks whose inscription or whose likeness is on that coin. And the person correctly answers, it's Caesar's. And so Jesus says, as we know, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. In other words, there is an ability for us to live in the political sphere, to render to Caesar what is Caesar's, to love our neighbor as ourself, if you will, and we can render to God what is God's. We can love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We can achieve both great commandments. So Christ 
by this answer just sets the example for us of we are able to be in the political sphere without getting sucked into the political sphere. Let's look at then the whole of scripture. And of course, we begin looking at the Old Testament. And before looking at some heroes of the Old Testament that are familiar to us, we must remember that even the bringing of the law, the fact that God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments really was a, um, a way for mankind to deal with its fallenness. The law is a gift and government is a gift because it is a way that we are able to handle the fallenness of man um, in a just way. So the law is a gift. But then we look at some heroes of the Old Testament that we're so familiar with, and we see which e with each of these heroes, God used his people to influence the civil government of the day, whether that government was good or evil, to help bring solutions to the culture's biggest problems, to help bring relief to the culture's biggest pains. We think of Joseph, who was used by God through much trial and tribulation to become Pharaoh's number two. And as Pharaoh's number two, he rescued the whole Mediterranean basin from famine. So there God is using his person right in the highest realms of civil government to help in a community's, a culture's biggest problem. Later on in the biblical record, we have Daniel. Daniel who lives under four different kings, some who are Babylonian, one who is Babylonian, others who are Persian and Median. And Daniel over and over again is used by God to bring the God perspective to the leaders of these various kingdoms. And really, we could argue that through Daniel, revival is brought, certainly during Nebuchadnezzar's time. And so Daniel in proximity, trusted by the civil leaders, is used to bring about great things during his time. And then we have Esther, from whom we get the famous phrase, she was raised up for such a time as this. And that reference is to the rescue of the whole Jewish people. The Jewish people faced genocide under her sovereign, who happened to be her husband. And God used her to spare the Jewish people from genocide. The whole point here is, is that the Old Testament record is full of people used by God in, you know, godless regimes, godless governments to bring about God's purposes. How much more should it be for us who are living in the promise of the New Testament? And speaking of the New Testament, we come to the writings of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter, both who pick up very much on Christ's sentiment that we can be in the political sphere without being sucked in the political sphere. We look at a few of their writings. First, the Apostle Paul. In his letter to the Romans, he sets forth that government is very good. And he says, there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God, for he is God's servant for your good. And that word servant, perhaps translated as minister in your translation of the Bible, is the Greek word diaconus, which is the same word that is translated as deacon, as in a church deacon, in other scriptures in the New Testament. The point being that Paul attributes great value to the leaders of government, even if those leaders are corrupt. In another writing of Paul, this time a writing to his mentee, Timothy, with whom he has planted churches, He's giving Timothy some instructions for worship in the local church. And he mentions this. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4 says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So again, we see the Apostle Paul with a high value for the governing authorities, civil governing authorities, that we should pray for them because they exercise leadership. And we see there's two main reasons why Paul says we should pray for them, because we want to live peaceful, godly lives. Ideally, there's a relationship there for praying for our leaders. Even if we disagree with them, that should lead to peace and concord for us. But when it doesn't, it's okay. But we recognize that there's a relationship here between praying for those in authority and God's evangelistic endeavors. The fact that God wants all people to have a knowledge of the truth. And of course, we know truth, capital T, is Christ himself. So there is a relationship here. God values civil government. We should pray for our leaders. And then the Apostle Peter, 
picks up on the very same themes and we see him saying that the purpose of government is to punish those who do evil and to praise or reward, as other versions say, those who do good. First Peter 2.14. So again, a very high view of civil government, even when it's corrupt, even when it's not functioning as it should, the original design of government is to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. So the whole scriptural record from Genesis to Revelation is a picture of civil government as a gift from God to help us in this earthly time that we're in. Of course, we all long for the government of our king that Isaiah prophesied about, that the government should ultimately be on his shoulders. We long for that day, but in the meantime, he's given a civil government. And once we get through the era of the first century and we see Christendom uh, unfold, you know, the whole story of Western civilization, we see that generally speaking, Christianity's influence on civilization is a very good one. We see barbaric practices in Italy and in Europe and all the way to India that were changed, transformed, eliminated, because when the gospel came to a community, certain barbaric practices were eliminated because the gospel placed great value on the individual. And I love what one Canadian commentator, he's a writer, he's a psychologist by trade, but he's, he's a humorous man. Jordan Peterson said this about Western civilization. He said, I happen to be a big fan of Western civ, I think it beats the hell out of tyranny and starvation. In other words, generally speaking, Western Civ's influence on culture was good. It was one that brought about prosperity to people. And certainly we had this uh, certainly expressed in the whole American experiment as we've enshrined it in our constitution that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In other words, as Western civilization developed, we had in the American experiment this idea that religious liberty was key to prosperity. In commenting on this experiment and on the development of the Constitution, John Adams said this, he said, we should begin by setting conscience free. When all men of all religions shall enjoy equal liberty, property, and an equal chance for honors and power, we may expect that improvements will be made in the human character and the state of society. In other words, if we let people have free consciences, if we let them worship freely, it will bring about prosperity. And I believe that 200 years after the Constitution, we saw this played out well when we saw the falling of communism and the falling of the Berlin Wall. When Eastern Europe was opened up to the world again in the late 80s and early 90s, we saw when religious freedom was eliminated, the result was decay in all other domains of life. Whereas when you bring freedom to a people to think and to worship freely, it necessarily brings prosperity. So that's just an arc of, of God's valuing of civil government into religious liberty that we are, enjoy here in the United States, but that we still, as we're finding today, need to fight for regularly. So as we end up this first module, as we conclude this first module about why followers of Christ, why people of faith should care about civil government, we've seen that God has a high value of civil government. We see that when government is good by giving people the same freedom that God gave us in the Garden of Eden, prosperity naturally follows. But I want to end with two thoughts, because often when it comes to people of faith and our own wrestling with how and why, we should be involved with the civil government sphere. A couple of thoughts come up. One is the thought that politics is just downstream of culture. In other words, let's just focus our efforts on changing culture, sharing the gospel, evangelizing, and then that should trickle down into politics. We don't disagree with that. In fact, you know, there's no substitute for good leaders. When people in authority are people of faith and they're people of restraint and wisdom, um, it, the good effects on the culture are just incredible. However, I don't think that means we should completely abandon our role in politics. In fact, that would be foolish. We look just 50 years ago to the Roe v. Wade decision. In other words, a political decision made by the judicial branch of our government. And we see how that political decision has affected our culture terribly in the last 50 years, where we are now at counting 61 million plus abortions resulting from a judicial decision made 50 years ago. 
of course that judicial decision was made in a culture. I'm not arguing that point, but what I'm trying to say is that political decisions also have ramifications on culture. They, they affect one another. And so we should care about political decisions. Which brings us to the fact that in New Hampshire, we have an incredible opportunity to affect, yes, our culture, including culture in politics or the political sphere of culture. With New Hampshire legislature's general court, as it's called, being the fourth largest legislative body in the English speaking world, it means that they're very local. For 1.3 million people, we have 400 state reps. So they each represent about 3,000 people. This means that your legislator is just a phone call away. And if we ever have things that we want to share with them, we can access them very easily. It's an opportunity like none other uh, in the state of the union, in, in the United States. And with that, I'm really teeing up Ellen for her part as we prepare our second module here, Ellen will follow on this theme of how unique New Hampshire is. And she has her own story of discovering how unique New Hampshire was from her own background. So Ellen, let me let you pick it up with module two. Thanks, Neil. Neil has been talking about things in module one that are applicable to anyone who wants to bring their faith into civic life. What I'm going to do now is start concentrating on New Hampshire specific things. Now, if you're watching this and you're not from New Hampshire, I still think you can get something out of this because it might inspire you to go learn about your own state, which each, each state has its own ways, its own opportunities for citizens to get involved. Now, Neil talked about some of the things in culture and in politics that could be discouraging how things are affecting each other. Is it worth getting involved? Yes, it is. If anything, people of faith have even more to offer civic government when things seem to be discouraging, when the right to life seems to be on a downward slope, when there's concern over religious liberty. On those times more than ever, we have a responsibility and an opportunity to bring our faith into civic life. As Neil said, I've got some stories about uh, coming to the State House in Concord. When my children were little and I had first moved to New Hampshire from Florida, I was very surprised that instead of a state capital, you know, not just physically, but uh, in its reputation being far away from the people, New Hampshire's state capital was just a few miles up the turnpike. And I went up there one day just to check it out. And at the time, I had a three-year-old with me. And the first thing I noticed when I walked into the state house is there's no security. There's no metal detector. There's nobody asking, what are you doing there? And this has not changed in all the years I've been here. The New Hampshire state house is yours. It's ours. It belongs to everyone who lives in New Hampshire. You are free to walk in. You are free to look around. You are free to ask questions. Now, my three-year-old and I were walking through the state house one day and came to an elevator. And I warned the three-year-old, as a parent should, don't run in when the door opens, wait for people to come out. And being three years old, when the elevator door opened, he ran right in and slammed right into Governor John Sununu, at the time governor of New Hampshire. And I thought, somebody is surely going to escort us from the building. No, Governor Sununu laughed, patted my son on the head, said no problem, and kept going. He was not surrounded by people trying to keep him from the people of New Hampshire. That's the kind of state house we have. Just walking through the halls, you're going to get a chance to see and meet the people who represent you. Ever since then, I have been totally sold on how open New Hampshire government is. But over time, I've learned there are other things that make it unique. Now that goes back to when New Hampshire became a state. You'll find some things about New Hampshire that may be different from where you're from or things that maybe you lived in New Hampshire all your life and you didn't know. For instance, did you know that the colony of New Hampshire declared independence from Great Britain six months before the Declaration of Independence was signed? When New Hampshire declared its independence, like many other colonies, but in a special way, they did not want any concentrated executive power. They did not want anything that resembled the monarchy from which they were declaring their independence. So what happened when the New Hampshire Constitution was written? One of the first things the framers did 
was make sure our executive was limited in ways that some other governors are not. In New Hampshire, unlike most other states, governors are elected every two years. That means that every two years, instead of four, as is typical in other states, the governor has to go before the people and say, how am I doing? It is a, a high level of accountability that the governor needs to stay in touch with the people and must go before them every two years in order to either stay in office or, or for anyone who wants to take over, they have to be willing to go before the voters every two years. Another thing our governor works with that other governors don't is an executive council. There are five executive councilors in New Hampshire, each elected from a different region of the state. And those councilors aren't just there to advise. Those councilors have authority over approving every state contract over $10,000. That's a lot of contracts. They also get to vote up or down on the governor's nominations to courts and nominations to executive positions like commissioner of education or commissioner of health and human services. The governor makes nominations after thoughtfully considering different candidates, but the council has the final say. At least three out of the five counselors have to approve whoever the governor nominates or else that nomination will not go through. Again, a check on the governor even within the executive branch. Uh, the council itself has a lot of fiscal responsibility, but where do they get, how do they know what contracts to put out? We go to the House and Senate now. The budget comes from the House and the Senate. Once that budget is passed, it's the council that decides where the contracts go to actually take those budget provisions and put them into effect. Now let's look at the composition of the New Hampshire legislature. As Neil said, we have the fourth largest legislative body in the English speaking world with 400 state representatives and 24 senators. New Hampshire has about 1.3 million people. Now that means that each representative, if you were to divide it per capita, represents 3,000, 3,500 constituents, although that varies from town to town. Some towns, for instance, have several that uh, serve at large. They serve the entire town. Others, especially in our larger cities, uh, where the cities have wards, there will be representatives elected by ward, so they represent a certain part of the city. Now here's something that makes New Hampshire different from every other state. Our legislators, representatives and senators alike, are paid $100 a year. That's right, 100. They are essentially volunteers. When you call or contact a representative or a senator, you are not talking to a professional politician. You're talking to a neighbor. You're talking to someone who may be a small business owner, might be a student, might be retired, might be juggling jobs so that they can serve in Concord and then go back to their job on other days of the week or other parts of the year. For the state representatives, they have no staff, no office, no desk. Their desk is where they are. And the only staff to which they have access is not a personal secretary, but a legislative staff that does things like uh, review bills to be drafted. We'll talk about that later. The senators get one administrative assistant for each three senators, so they get some administrative assistance. But for the most part, a representative and a senator is a volunteer, their office is wherever they are, and they answer to you. Whenever you call them or contact them using the state website that we will show you later, the contact information they put on there is likely to be their home or their cell number. When you call them, you're either talking to them or their spouse or their child or their, whoever is in the household with them. And that reinforces to us, we need to remember we're always dealing with neighbors. Our judicial system in New Hampshire is based on appointment. We do not have an elected judiciary. The Supreme Court, when it is fully staffed, has uh, five justices, one chief justice and four associates. Uh, it is the only level of appeals in New Hampshire. 
on the county level, there are superior courts. That's where most jury trials are handled, where felonies are handled. Um, you will also find in the county courts, uh, if you go to the courthouse, the county courthouse closest to you, you will find, that's where you'll find uh, mostly probate matters there. Circuit courts are more on the municipal level. That's where you go for traffic issues. That's where misdemeanors can be heard. Um, so three levels of courts, basically. Municipal is circuit, superior is generally county, and then the Supreme Court sits in Concord. Voting in New Hampshire, first thing you do, choose a political party. You know the Democrats, you know the Republicans. Sometimes the Libertarian Party gets a column on the ballot in New Hampshire. That depends on how Libertarian candidates have done in a previous election. You have to get a certain percentage in an election in order to get your own column as a party in a later election. When are elections held? In New Hampshire, the municipal, the town and city things are generally in the spring. There's no single date for that covers every town. You will want to contact your town clerk, we'll talk a little more about that in a minute, to find out the dates of your town elections. For the state and federal level, our primaries are in September, the general election is in November every other year, even numbered years. How do you find out what the schedule is for elections in your town? Your town or city clerk is your best source of information. That's where you can find out the schedule of elections, including special elections. That's where you can find sample ballots, which are very important to look at in advance before you vote. This is especially true for your municipal elections because there might be a town budget or city budget on there or warrant articles. You'll want to read about those in advance and not be caught by surprise when you go to the polls. This way you'll be able to cast a more informed vote. You can also find out when you look at a sample ballot who the candidates are. Who, you, who do you want to meet? Who do you want to reach? Who do you want to find out about before you go in? Also, the town clerk will have information on registering to vote and on absentee balloting. So look up your town or city clerk. Most towns have a website, otherwise there will be a phone number. That office will give you the information you need to know. Why do you want to do this? This is part of taking your faith and bringing it to the civic world. You're honoring God by taking your civic responsibility seriously. Now in New Hampshire, with so many state representatives and so many municipal opportunities, you might consider running for office. There are so many to choose from. On the local level, there's aldermen, select boards, uh, there are mayors in the uh, larger, or I think there are 10 cities in New Hampshire that have mayors. The other municipalities work with town councils or select boards. There are school boards, there are budget committees, library trustees, there are zoning boards, planning boards. Some of these are elected, some are appointed, but on the local level, there are many opportunities to serve. This gives you an even better sense of what your own town is like. You get to know more people. You understand what goes into municipal government. And there's something else that's important about local offices. Now, you don't want to use an office as a spring just for the sake of being a springboard to another. But the fact is, many state representatives and state senators got their feet wet in government and in learning about their town from serving on the municipal level. Now, if you decide you want to try to be state rep. Remember, there are 400 seats. There's a, a lot of turnover. Every town needs people who are willing to serve and they need a deep bench. Several people who are willing to serve, to put themselves out there, to offer themselves in service to the community. To be a state representative, the requirements are at least 18 years old. You need to be a resident of the town you want to rep represent. And the filing fee, which you will take to your town clerk, is $2. That's not much, $2. You can also uh, submit some petition signatures instead. But I think it's kind of fun to think of taking $2 bills down to your town clerk, filling out a form, and there you are. You're a candidate. You will be on the ballot that year for your town. State senator has uh, slightly different requirements. Minimum age is 30. 
You have to be uh, been in New Hampshire for seven years, live in the district you're supposed to represent, and then uh, a $10 filing fee will be filed at the Secretary of State's office up in Concord. For your local offices and state rep, the town clerk is where you file. For a state senator or a statewide office or a federal office, you'll be going up to the state house to the Secretary of State's office to get your paperwork done. To learn about your elected officials, New Hampshire has one of the most useful state government websites that you will find. It might not be the prettiest, but it is certainly one of the most useful. If you take a few minutes and look at the state website of our neighbor to the south, Massachusetts, you'll see one that looks really nice. But I have spoken with people who live in Massachusetts who have tried to find out how their representative voted on a specific bill and it simply isn't user friendly. The website is not terribly helpful in helping you find out what records are. Here in New Hampshire, you'll see that address, gencourt.state.nh.us. Gencourt means general court. That is the formal name for the New Hampshire legislature. But if you just Google New Hampshire legislature or New Hampshire general court, NH house, whatever, this is what you'll come up with. You will see in the uh, slides here, there's a red arrow pointing to the column on the left side of the legislative homepage. And you will see your legislator. Click on that and you'll come to a page where you can look up your legislator by town or by name if you know the legislator's name. And when you click on that page, that will bring you to information on each legislator in your district. Here's a sample from a Nashua legislator. When you click on that, you will find her name, you will find the address, and that address isn't an office, that's her home. You will see a phone number. Again, that's not an office, that's hers, probably a cell number. You can learn about how to reach your representatives, but you can also see what bills has that representative sponsored this year, What's their voting record? You click on that and you will see roll calls from every roll call vote the House has taken in the current session. You can also learn a little bit about the representative. They choose what to put up for their biography. You can learn about uh, their educational background. What is their professional background? What are their interests? You might discover that a representative is interested in libraries or education or um, maybe may have a, a uh, career in common with you. And these are touch points you can use to get to know your legislator. When you introduce yourself to that legislator or when you write or call, it reinforces you're talking to a neighbor. So this is a really helpful part of the website. I love it that you can find out so much uh, sitting at home before you actually make a phone call. The opportunities you have abound, whether it's on the local level or the state level. And why are we looking at David and Goliath here? Because when you look at New Hampshire, our home, the home that we love, Cornerstone, everyone in Cornerstone is committed to New Hampshire. But if you look at polls, you'll find that New Hampshire ranks dead last in the percentage of adults who identify themselves as highly religious. Another way of saying this is we have by some measures, the most unchurched state in the nation. Well, what's the point? Why should we get involved? Why should we even bring our faith? Look at what happened with David and Goliath. David did not come forth with an army. David came forth with five smooth stones and was able to bring down an aggressor. That should inspire us. What we need is simplicity, understand what we're getting into, but take that faith, that simplicity, and we can bring that to the civic government and make a difference. New Hampshire gives you so many opportunities, no excuse for sitting on the sidelines. This is a wonderful place to live, a wonderful place to be engaged in government. And Neil is going to take you through the process by which a bill becomes a law, it is a process, and you have opportunities at every step to make your voice heard. Neil?
Ellen, thanks so much. I always find your passion for the Granite State is contagious. It's, it's, it's real. <laughs> and I appreciate it. And I, I love being around you. And I want so many other people to get around you through this webinar so they can catch the, the contagion, best kind of contagion we could catch. As Ellen said, we have seen, first, we discussed the incredible value that God puts on civil government, his high view, the, a very dignified look at civil government in the state. Second, Ellen just shared, of all 50 states in the union, New Hampshire is unique in the opportunity we have to influence and be a part. It's very local. It's very democratic, if you will, in terms of people's ability to participate. Lastly, this third module, I will bring you through a chronology of how a bill becomes a law and your best opportunities to influence that process. And Ellen, I'm gonna invite you as we do this, I will, please feel free to provide color. Your experience is invaluable, so I will not be offended if you interrupt and add color where that's appropriate. Will do. So as I mentioned, really the best way to think about this is as a chronology. The legislative session is from January to June, generally speaking, every year. Even years happen to be election years. Odd years are budget years. So every other year in the legislature has a different tenor, a different tone based on that. But we begin our module even before January, and we look to just late summer, early fall. And New Hampshire is unusual in that only legislators can propose bills or law in New Hampshire. This is unlike other states where they have referendums, where citizens can petition, create a referendum, and can legislate, if you will, that way. So if you have an idea for a law, the only way it's going to get in the process is if a legislator, either a representative, one of the 400 reps, or one of the 24 senators, puts it forth as an idea. Those ideas take the form of what we call LSRs, Legislative Service Requests. In the late November, early December, or kind of advent timeframe, these legislative service requests start to pop up. And this is where legislators have taken ideas from you, they've gotten ideas themselves, and have started to be begin this process. And legislative service requests, sometimes, sometimes in-house we reference them as baby bills. They're just the beginning of this, of this bill process. So one thing that Ellen does for Cornerstone and for you, during that advent timeframe, she'll be looking as you can see, the yellow arrow on the front page of the Gen Court website, there's something that says search LSRs. So you can look in December, generally December timeframe, you can start to search for LSRs. And what you'll find is just the title of a bill. We have no access to the text, but you along with Ellen can start to figure out, hmm, by the titles of these bills, what sorts of bills are going to be proposed next year in the next legislative session? you can kind of get a, a preview of what's coming. And so Ellen will begin to look for titles and she'll start to compile a spreadsheet so that we can decide what, what, what are we looking for? And you can do the very same thing. As Ellen indicated earlier, the general court's website is very accessible. It's very user friendly. By spending some time on it, you can find out a lot of great information. And then the legislative season proper begins. So starting in January, what will happen is the Senate President and the Speaker of the House, as LSRs have gone through a little legislative check process, an administrative process where some legislative staffers are making sure that bills are not um, at odds with or are not all repeating a uh, law that is already, already existent, then these bills will come to the leaders of both chambers, Senate President and Speaker of the House, and these chamber leaders will then assign certain bills based on their content to various committees. The House has 24 standing committees and the Senate has 12 standing committees. And that's where they'll get a designation. So if a bunch of representatives have come together, mainly as the sponsors of a bill, the des designation will be HB, and usually a three or four digit number, actually anywhere from a one to a four digit number. So House Bill 1 usually has to do with the budget, House Bill 558, whatever. HB, that means it's originating in the House because the main sponsors are representatives. Likewise, some senators will get together and they will have co-sponsored bills. And these bills will get the designation SB for Senate bill and then a one to four digit number. 
and they'll be assigned to committees based on their content because different committees have different spheres of influence they're dealing with. Maybe it's veterans affairs, maybe it's um, finance, maybe it's ways and means, maybe it's health and human services, education, all the various spheres of our common life are divided into these committees. And here's where the real work begins on the bill and then here's where our opportunity to best influence these bills comes. Because one of the first moves that the committee that is handling a bill will make is to invite public comment and that is called a hearing. And we know about hearings just a week before they occur. On Thursday night, the legislature will publish its calendar for the following week. On Friday, the Cornerstone team will take a look at what what committee hearings are happening. And then on Saturday, through the family update, we will send you information about here are some hearings that are happening that you may care about based on our wheelhouse issues. And that's where once you know about a hearing taking place, you have several options as far as how you can best influence that process. I like to think in terms of gold, silver, and bronze. So perhaps the gold standard would be, can you come to that hearing in person? They typically last a couple hours with sometimes the more hot button issues that garner a lot of concern. Hearings will be recessed and then started again. So it might happen over two or three days and two to three or four hour segments each. And when you come in person, you have a couple of choices. You can, as you walk in, you see that horseshoe shaped or that U shaped table set up that a house committee is meeting at, for example. At the end of the U closest to you and closest to the door, there'll be a blue sign-in sheet and you can sign that sheet with just your name and your hometown and a check mark indicating whether you oppose or support the bill now that's very important and that is definitely worth your half an hour parking and coming up to the committee hearing room and then making that check mark because the hearing will start with the chairperson of the committee asking the vice chair or the clerk what is the status of this blue sheet that we will now enter into the record and oftentimes it sets the tone. You know, if 30 people are for the bill and only one is against, that sets the tone right away for how the hearing will go. And I think what has been sad and grievous to us at times has been with issues that Cornerstone cares about, when, when it's that lopsided, it can be very discouraging. Because Alan and I and the Cornerstone team, we're operating under a certain thesis as we share this Concord 101 webinar. And that is that just one unit more of cultural engagement from the faithful could bring 10 units of cultural change. We just believe a little more showing up to the battle, if you will, can equal great results. Just like David with his five smooth stones, you know, just one stone fell the giant. We feel that you know, even you coming and just making your check mark, mark on that blue sheet could, could, could make a big difference. That's so important too, because a lot of the communication with the committee goes on informally, not just during the hearing itself, but there are conversations in the hallways that could make a difference. And if it seems intimidating to testify before a committee, perhaps a one-on-one -on -one conversation could make a difference. Nobody else can bring your story, but you. Your voice is important. Even if you just say, I live in thus and such a town, and I support or oppose this bill, there may be somebody on that committee from your town and they'll wanna reach out to you and learn more. Your presence is so important. That's so good, Ellen, because as you've mentioned, even those committee meetings, both beginning and transition times, there are moments to introduce yourself. If, if you, like you've said, if, if one of the committee members is you are a constituent of them, what a great opportunity to just say, hello, my name is, I'm in your constituency. Thank you for, for serving. You know, I couldn't agree more, Ellen, regarding the personal connect. And on that note, as Ellen said, your voice is so important. The other thing you can do is you can sign a pink card where you just put your name, hometown, and whether you oppose or support a bill. And that's you saying, I would like to speak during this hearing. Remember, this is a public hearing and the whole purpose is to hear what do people think about this? Generally speaking, you'll be called at some point during the hearing and you'll have two to three minutes to share your story. And your story, your narrative, your thoughts, your opinion about the bill, they are so important. Ellen is great about saying that the framework for your remarks should be thought of as this, clarity, brevity, and charity. You want to be clear, say very soon and very clearly whether you oppose or support the bill. Brevity, you only get two to three minutes 
that you want to be affected by being precise. And then charity. Remember, you're representing Christ or you're representing your faith background. And so there's no need to employ rhetorical tricks that just don't work or there's no need to be mean-spirited. There's no need really to preach at the committee. Often if someone takes a preachy tone, I mean, you can imagine, do you like being preached at? Um, it, it just is not effective mode of communication. But you can be strong. You can certainly cite scripture if you'd like. But really, it's the natural law arguments that work the most. Now, the reason why your narrative and your story is so important in the process is because, as we'll discover later on, after the hearing, the committee will go into its executive session while they'll discuss what they've heard. And even when representatives or senators agree with you, their own stories are good, but even better are the stories that you share. So during that executive session, when we as the public are no longer allowed to speak into the process, but we can observe their dialogue about the bill and their decision making before they vote on the bill you'll hear them say as we heard from that citizen from merrimack or as we heard from the young lady from henniker and that sort of thing so our stories our opinions even if you just simply say hello my name is and i'm opposed to this bill thank you for your time you'll always be thanked by the chair of the committee for taking your time even if they happen to disagree with you and it's just so important for us to be there in these sessions when decisions are being made for people, for the whole state. So that's the gold standard is you showing up at the hearing. And I think Ellen and I would say, you know, when you look at the legislative session from January to June, depending on your schedule and your availability, you know, think in terms of one, two, three, or four times that you can make it during those six months and give your opinion. That's the gold standard. A silver standard would be you could also call your representative, and we encourage you to. Also using clarity, brevity, and charity. Remember in the case of the representative, you're actually getting their home number, their cell number. And so you may end up leaving a message. You may end up talking to them. You know, the phone might be picked up by a spouse or a child, and then you are connecting with them. So you're connecting with the neighbor. So just use the same courtesies. We can make it very clear um, why you think the way you do. And they may come back and say, I totally disagree with you. But the thing we don't want to happen is for them to say, I never heard from my constituents or from people. Very, very important to remember, because that is one thing Cornerstone cannot counter, is when a representative takes refuge behind, well, I didn't hear from my district on this. Absolutely. So the telephone call would be silver, and then bronze would be the email. It's the most convenient for us, probably the least effective, but it's certainly, certainly better than nothing. In your email subject line, you just want to put the bill number and your position. If you are a constituent of this legislator that you are writing to, put that in because that will uh, increase its priority to the legislator if you're one of their constituents. And again, brevity, clarity, and charity. What we've heard over and over again is what doesn't work is threats. You know, if you become threatening in your email, such as, I'm not going to vote for you next time if you do this, those things are very ineffective because no one wants to be communicated with in that way. Another thing to remember for the email is that Cornerstone does not employ a mass emailing software. You know, many policy organizations do, but the reason that we don't do that in New Hampshire is because over and over again, these neighbor legislators, they just indicate that it's not effective. When they, oh, can they, tell, they will tell us straight out, they, they do not want to get mass emails generated from a machine. They want to hear from you. What do you have to say? They would rather get one sentence from a New Hampshire resident than a paragraph cranked out over and over again by a program. It's so true. And so although a little effort, but even your one sentence opposition matters way more than us providing you with the ability to just click and send, which is why we don't do that. So that is what you can do and how important it is for you to be present at those hearings in some way, shape, or form. Now, just to help you get there, you see the red arrows pointing to the state house. Most of the committee activity actually happens in the building behind or to the west of the state house as indicated by the yellow arrow. It's called the legislative office building. It's a beautiful building. It was originally a post office, I believe, but has been retrofitted to be a, a gorgeous uh, committee building. And in fact, the picture that you saw earlier, that brown panel building, much of the, of, of the architecture is like that. You will want to make time for parking. If you just look up Concord Parking, 
Um, you'll find that there isn't a lot of central parking, but there is plenty of parking on the street. There are garages nearby. And you just want to give yourself plenty of time to get there. It's such a great experience to get there. And I can let you know if Ellen or I or Cornerstone is inviting you to be present at a hearing, we will be there and we will help orient you. So we can help you get to where you need to go. It'd be our pleasure. Moving on in the process, as I indicated, after that hearing is over, they've spent two hours, maybe a total of four, maybe a total of six hours listening to public comment. Then they will go into executive session. As I indicated earlier, this is where we can observe the committee's deliberations. We are not allowed to speak into the process anymore, but that deliberation is public. And this is where the purpose of the committee is to create a recommendation for their larger chamber. So a house committee is gonna come up with a recommendation for the whole house. A Senate committee is going to come up with a recommendation for the whole Senate of whether it's a good law or a bad law. In the language that they use, they will say whether it's a good law, OTP ought to pass. That's the committee saying the larger chamber, we ought to pass this. Or it's a bad law, they'll say ITL, which stands for inexpedient to legislate. This is not a good law. A wonderful thing about New Hampshire is every bill gets its day in the full chamber. This is unlike our federal government, unlike in many states. In other words, a bill cannot be killed in committee. If the committee says, we don't like this, they can't kill it. They will just say, it's ITL, inexpedient to legislate. And then every so often, every few weeks in the legislative calendar from January to March now we're talking about, a full chamber will meet, the full house, the full Senate will meet, and they'll go through all these bills that have come out of committee and they'll listen to the recommendation the committee has made, but then still the full chamber gets to vote on it. Those recommendations are important because each chamber is looking at so many laws, so many bills. Over the course of a session, the entire legislature will look at sometimes 1,100, 1,200 bills. Is that accurate, mm -hmm. Ellen? It is, and that, that makes the committee recommendations important because no single legislator is going to be able to process 1,000 bills. The legislator will be very familiar with what comes to her or his committee, but to find out about the other bills, they're going to rely on the committee reports printed in the House calendar. So those committee reports may be all that a legislator knows about most of the bills they're going to be voting on that day. So the committee recommendations are crucial. Which circles back to two things. I think number one, being present at the committee hearings when possible. And number two, as we're also fond of saying, elections have consequences. So committee leadership, if we've put in, if we've put in the chair seat committee persons who are noble, <laughs> then we'll get noble results. But if we, uh, if we have ones in there that uh, don't share our same values, then the results can be disastrous which is why it's important that we be engaged. So this process, as I mentioned, goes on January to, to March. We come to a point kind of midway through the season where crossover happens. And crossover is when all of the bills that have passed the House then go on to the Senate. All the bills that have passed the Senate then go on to the House. And they must go through the same process again from March to June because the end result, you know, where this train is headed is to two chambers agreeing on language for a bill that will then go to the governor to either sign or reject. So as I mentioned, from March to May or June, that whole process repeats in the other chamber, which means the good news for us is, is that's why Cornerstone may issue several calls to action on the same bill, because as yes. the bill goes through different stages, there's multiple opportunities for us to interact with the people who are deciding about its future. So that's why, you know, yeah. one bill may- And you may, may feel discouraged that you can't come or you can't be there all the time. Believe me, having brought up kids, I understand you can't just pack them all up and come to Concord, but you have an opportunity to speak to the committee before the hearing, you can send a message, you can come to the hearing, you can reach the committee members afterward before they vote, phone, email, a letter. Then you can contact your representatives before the full chamber does it. There are multiple opportunities and at no point need you be discouraged because there are multiple opportunities to speak into a bill. And we might also add it's never too late. In fact, I think when, when, a, when a bill goes through both chambers, we can see sometimes strategy needs to change. We've yeah. heard a certain amount of testimony as it went through one chamber, and then as it goes through their chamber, 
we can change our strategy based on, you know, what's the press saying? What's the, what's the public opinion? You know, what does it look like? So there and really perhaps is- perhaps we hear stories that we didn't hear in the first chamber. Perhaps people are willing to come forward. That can make a big difference. It's so true, Ellen, it's so true. And as I mentioned, where we're headed here is when language from both chambers is the same on a bill, recon they're reconciled, then it goes through a little process called enrollment where it's making its way to the government's, the governor's desk, excuse me. And then as a bill heads toward the governor's desk, the governor has a few options. If the governor signs the bill, it will become a law. If the governor doesn't sign the bill, it still becomes law. It's just a way of the governor saying, I'm not endorsing this, this is on the legislature. Or the governor can veto the bill. If the governor vetoes the bill saying, I don't want this to become law, it heads back to both chambers. And if both chambers can overturn that veto with what is called a supermajority, that means two thirds vote in both chambers, then the governor's veto is overturned and it will become law. We saw that in recent New Hampshire history with the repeal of the death penalty. Both chambers voted to repeal the death penalty. It went to the governor's desk. He vetoed that. But Ellen, as I understand, because you've shared this, by a one person vote in both chambers, they reached their two third supermajority and the death penalty was repealed. Is that correct? It doesn't take much. One person's vote matters a lot. Never forget that. So that's amazing. And so that is how a bill becomes a law in New Hampshire. And so when it's at that final stage, that's where often, kind of in the May to June timeframe, our call to action will be, please call the governor. Well, maybe we'll ask you, please call and ask the governor to sign HB you know, 456, or please call the governor and ask him to veto SB 123. The governor's office is well staffed and you know, we joke, or not joke, but we, we talk about just taking two minutes, take two, take two to call your legislator. Well, taking the governor is really more like take 45 in the sense that it's just 45 seconds to call 271-2121. Staffer will pick up. You just say, hi, my name is, I'm from, please ask the governor to veto this bill. Thank you. And they are taking that tally. So even your 45 seconds, you know, calling on your way to work, on the way home, just briefly from your your kitchen, that little phone call can make all the difference. Ellen, any thoughts about calling the governor's office? Just, uh, you can, they're always very courteous. Um, your phone call does not have to take a long time. In fact, that's probably not the time to give detailed information over the phone. Over the phone, the message is, please sign, please veto. If you have a longer story or more information you want, put that in writing or an email, send it to the governor's office and that, that could be helpful. That's great. And so as we wrap up this session, we just wanna familiarize yourself with some tools, just helpful tools that can help you in this whole process. And of course, there's nothing like real experience. You know, We long for you to just come with us to some of these hearings. I think once you get into a hearing and see it unfold, and we've had many, many citizens just come and sit and observe hearings first to better understand what's going on. We, we can't emphasize enough how important that would be. Of course, as Alan has already mentioned, that GenCourt website is so important, especially when it comes to understanding these bills and, and what, can, what is in them. The main search bar on the front page of the GenCourt website is a search bar where you can put in a bill number, HB 456, for example. There is an advanced search, so if you've forgotten the number, you know, generally speaking, we will cite everything by number all the time, so it's easy for you to find. But if you've forgotten it, there's an advanced search feature that will allow you to search on title and concept and ideas and things like that. But you search for that bill, you're gonna get a wealth of information. You'll come to a screen like this that you see with the red arrow, and one thing you want to find out is the text. What does the bill actually say? And how I wish that every bill was as short as this one that we have here, just nine lines. Some bills will get into 30, 50 pages. And of course, that's why Cornerstone and our affiliated attorneys, we take time to analyze the bills, the ones that we're very concerned about. We analyze those, we provide our analysis for you, but you too should not be intimidated by reading these bills. You will also be able to find not only the text of the bill, but what's called the docket. And the docket is, the process that we've just walked through during this third module. Where is it in this process? Again, a little playing around with that, a little familiarization with it will, will make it quite evident what's going on, you know, what committee is going to and, 
and whatnot. We encourage you to see where it is in the process in the document. You'll also be able to see how did people vote? How did the committee vote by individual member? How did the whole house vote? You'll be able to get that because you'll be able to access the voting records, both from the docket or as Ellen mentioned earlier, from the individual legislator yourself. And that can become important at election time. If someone in your district is running again, they're an incumbent, you can look at their voting record and get a feel for how did they vote on certain things that I care about. Now, outside of our webinar, what you'll want to do is you'll want to keep updated with us to find out what are the issues we're tracking, what we're watching, and what you can do about them. And the best way you can do that is by connecting with us. There's several ways to connect with us. One way that we love to keep you updated and kind of breaking information or breaking alerts is if you'll text LIFE2020 to 474747, you'll get on our, our text list. We'd love to be able to text you what's going on. At nhcornerstone.org, if you scroll down, all the way down at the bottom of our front page, you can sign up for those Saturday morning family updates that we send weekly, especially when session, when the legislature is in session. You can also go to our blog at the website you see there to keep updated with what's happening there. And there's also a website that we have up during times of crisis, which is dogood603.org. And this is our portal to help communities connect and help in times of great crisis. Ellen, what else would you share about connecting with us? I would say there are two websites you need to bookmark and become familiar with. The first one, of course, is the Gen Court website, the, the legislative website. But please also come get to know us at nhcornerstone.org. When you look at the website, you'll get a sense of the full breadth of Cornerstone's work. Advocacy is only a part of it. In order to get those weekly updates on legislation, as Neil said, scroll to the bottom of Cornerstone's page and you can subscribe. Those are very important because as the legislative session moves along, it will let you know the status of each bill and is this a time for really effective communication. If you have any questions about Concord 101, email us cornerstone at nhcornerstone.org and just put Concord 101 question in the subject line and that will get to us and we'll be able to respond to you. Also, if you have a story, you have relevant information that you think legislators ought to know and you're not quite sure how to go about letting them hear about it, please contact us again, cornerstone at nhcornerstone.org. We'll be happy to work with you find ways to tell your story, find ways that would be effective in conversation, in written testimony, in a letter to the editor. We will help you tell your story because nobody else can tell your story the way you can. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, yes. And Ellen, as, you've, as you started to share that, you reminded me of um, several of the things that we've sh shared about today are available on our website. So Ellen just mentioned sharing your story. On our nhcornerstone.org website, of course, there's the blog that will just keep you up to date, you know, what legislation are we looking at? And then relative to you sharing your story, please do contact us. But if you see here under Four Citizens, poly, Policy and Legislation, How to Testify on Bills in Concord, we, we walk through some of the basics of the very things that we've shared during this webinar. So you can catch it on our website too. Just always be brief, be clear, and remember you're dealing with neighbors. So good. We thank you so much for spending this time with us on our Concord 101 webinar. We hope that you've come away with a solid understanding of God's high view of government, uh, with a great appreciation for the opportunity we have in New Hampshire to affect things, and with a very practical understanding of how a bill come, becomes a law and how you can best participate in that process. Thank you very much. Thank you.